Wow, that was amazing how that song just connected with the message today. <laughs> I love how God does that. Just, wow, right, completely together there. Let's pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. When you're in love, when you're really, really in love, head over heels in love, everyone knows it. It's a type of love that makes kids go, ew, and uh, teenagers go, ugh. But, you know, deep inside, they're like, I want that one day. <laughs> it's the type of love that you post on Facebook, they post their anniversary pictures, all cute anniversary pictures, or uh, they just become a poet and they start declaring poems underneath the stars and or composing love songs and singing a love song down the aisle. I know because that that's actually what happened with Kevin and I. Um, he was the poet and I was the songwriter. <laughs> and uh, it's amazing how when you experience that kind of love, you want to hold on to it because you know it's something very special. It's something that comes by, you know, maybe a few times in your lifetime, but not very often. And it's something you want to hold on to and, and as very, very special. And this is what David experiences here. In Psalm 23, it's a love song to his shepherd. And it's, I, I know it because I recognize it, and all of us who've had that experience recognize it. He's in love with his shepherd. In Psalm 23, it's on the front of your bulletin. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. A lot of us, we don't really understand the concept of shepherd because we haven't grown up where there are sheep and shepherds just dotting the landscape all around us. And uh, David, he was a shepherd and he knew what that meant. I find it really, uh, really amazing that he uses the word shepherd he writes about God in so many ways. He writes about God as his rock, his redeemer, his deliverer, his, the one who comes to rescue him when he's in trouble. But the shepherd is by far the most intimate view of God that he portrays. Because a shepherd lives with his sheep. He knows his sheep. They know him. He is their everything. He provides for everything that they need. And David knows this, so he chooses the picture of the shepherd for his love song to God. Uh, there's a picture of what Jesus knew this as well when, in John 10, and he calls himself the good shepherd who protects and lays his life down for his sheep. There's a picture of, this is what Jesus was talking about, the gate for the sheep. You see that, that hole? The hole there is the gate. Jesus says, I am the gate. And the shepherd used to actually lay down in that little hole there in between the sheep and danger, in between the sheep and the wolves, or the sheep and the, the bear or the lion coming to hurt them, or the person who wanted to steal a sheep away for their special feast they had coming up. Uh, that's not really familiar to us, but uh, I was with Kevin in Jamaica a few years back, and there were actually people who would steal goats because they wanted to make a big, a big uh, meal and, and a big party. So it did happen. It does happen now around the world, and it, it happens in places where there are goats, there are sheep. They're important for people. So anyway, Jesus, Jesus says, I am the gate, and I am the good shepherd, and I lay down my life for you. I protect you. I remember, have you ever felt what it's like to be protected? When I was in seventh grade, I, uh, one of those silly little stories that my friend and I tell all the time, 
when we get together to laugh. But uh, I was actually the goalie a lot of times. We would play soccer, and I was the goalie. I don't know why I always wanted to be the goalie. I guess because I felt like I was good at it. And so I would be in the goalie, <laughs> as the goalie in the goal. And we actually played with the, with the boys, too. And some of them were pretty good at soccer. So this one time, this one boy comes up, and he's got the ball, and I'm ready for him. I'm there. And he kicks it. And it hits me, I block it, but it hit me right in the mouth. And I had braces and, oh, you know, they just probably recently tightened them. And I was in such pain and I was, I was dying there, uh, but I blocked the ball. But my friend, my best friend, she was so protective of me. She was this little, short, uh, she's still short, uh, Filipino, she's 4'11". And back then she was, she was pretty small, but she was tough. She had muscles. She, she, she didn't let anyone walk all over her. But uh, she comes up to this boy and she's like, why did you just do that? Because he came in really hard with that ball right, right straight in the mouth. And she's like, why would you do that? Who do you think you are? Blah, blah. And, and he, he goes, well, I, I wrestle with my older sisters all the time. And what do you think you're going to do? So she says, she puts her hand out and he took her hand for some reason, and she takes him and she flips him. And he falls in the mud, and oh, we were just dying. But um, I don't condone violence of any kind, but I have to say that in that moment, <laughs> I felt protected. I felt like there was someone standing up for me, that, that if something were to happen, she'd always have my back. And that's what God does for us. He stands in between us and danger. He protects us. In fact, he loves us so much that he gave his life for us. He is our good, good shepherd. I love how he continues, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He provides for all of my needs. God was Israel's shepherd. And immediately when you're a Jew reading this, in, in those times especially, well, they probably sang it instead of reading it in the first place, but when they sang this, they, they knew what it meant for God to be shepherd because that's what God did. Through the wilderness, he provided for them. He gave them all that they needed. He led them, he protected them, he cared for them like a flock, a shepherd to his flock. And so here David is saying, the same God who worked the miracles in the desert is the same God who's going to meet my needs. The same God who brought manna from heaven is the God who's going to be with me today, who's going to bless me, who's going to care for me. Do you have financial needs today? God is your shepherd. He'll meet your needs. Do you have physical needs today? He is your shepherd. He'll meet your needs. Do you have relational needs today? He is your shepherd, and he will meet your needs. He is my shepherd. He is all that I need. A lot of times I think we worry, but I think about Gideon right now, my son, and he's just two years old. And my, myself and my husband, sometimes we worry, we stress. I, this whole nesting zone I'm in, I'm like, we got to... We, we, we're getting another one. We're going to be four of us. We've got we to gotta buy a house. I'm like looking at the numbers and how are we going to buy a house? How are we going to save enough to buy a house? You know, looking at all these figures and why it's stressing and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and, and my husband's like, oh no, <laughs> she's, uh. and uh, my son is just totally oblivious to all of this financial concern. And he, he could care less because he knows that we're with him. He doesn't have to fear. He doesn't have to worry. He doesn't have to worry when his next meal is going to be because mommy and daddy are going to take care of him. He doesn't have to worry about what he's going to wear the next day because we're going to provide for him. And a sheep is kind of like that. A sheep is kind of like a child or even more so, more oblivious because it's an animal. And he just follows his master knowing that his master is going to provide for all of his needs or, or her needs. And it reminds me of what Jesus said in Matthew 5, one of my favorite texts. And he said, don't worry. Don't worry about your food, about your clothes, about all these things. 
and it's up on the text. But seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Seek him first, and he's going to provide for all of your needs. So don't even worry about that. Those things don't even matter anyway. What matters is being near me, being close to me, having a relationship with me. Seek me first, and you don't need to worry about the rest of these things because I'm going to provide for you. I think a lot of times we have such a tight hold on things. It's kind of like gripping the sand in your, in your hand. All these things that don't really matter in the first place, and we're like holding on to it, trying to make it all work and make it all happen. And you know, the pieces of sand, they don't really stay too well in your hands. But I think about what God is calling us to do. He says, just let go of all those things that don't matter. Let go so that you can receive my blessings, my spiritual blessings, my love, my grace, my peace, all the things that I want to give you. And so if we just let go and let him just come into our lives, then he will take care of everything that we need. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down. It says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Have you been in the wilderness this week? Have you been stressed this week? Do you need to experience God's rest? He's got an oasis for you in the wilderness. And he wants to give you his rest. He wants you to lie down, to eat of his goodness, to drink of his living water, to experience his grace and his peace and his rest that only he can give. Some of us, I think, we don't really know how to rest. Uh, we're, we're just running around. At, I'm preaching to myself here. I've been literally just busy <laughs> all the time, whether it be something with work or something with home and trying to uh, get my whole life organized before our baby comes because, of course, when a baby comes, you're too, I mean, I know what it's like now. You're just too busy to get anything done. So I'm like, I'm trying to do everything at once. And God's like, just, just rest. And God calls all of us to that rest to the rest of his peace, of his grace. He invites us to spend time in his presence, to drink of his grace, to give us new energy so that we can keep walking in his ways and keep following him as his sheep. Why is it so hard for us many times to heed his invitation to rest? Why? You'd think it would be easy. It's because I believe we're listening to the wrong voice. In Palestine, there was a tour guide leading these groups, this group of people through. And he told them, we're going to see shepherds and sheep today. You probably see them along somewhere. And when you see the shepherd, you'll know because he leads the sheep. And they follow him. He doesn't you know, hit them or drive them. He just... He walks and they follow him. They know him. They le he leads by his voice. And so they were looking around, and you can imagine their confusion when they, they see this, uh, this, this man and all these sheep, and he's taking this big stick, and he's driving them, driving the sheep, driving them. And they're you know, trying, to, trying to go because they don't want to get hit by the stick, and you know, they're, they're moving. And... All these people look at the tour guide and they say, well, I thought you said that the shepherd doesn't drive the sheep. He leads the sheep. And they said, he said, oh, that's not the shepherd. That's the butcher. How many of us are listening to the wrong voice? Instead of listening to the shepherd's voice, the voice of rest, of peace, of grace, we're listening to the butcher's voice. And uh, the butcher, the, the shepherd says things like, rest in my work. I love you. I am all that you need. The butcher says, you need to work for people or for God to love you. If you don't do it, no one else will. 
Responsible adults are always busy. I mean, fill in the blank. These are the ones I've encountered. You may have other ones. These lies of the butcher, and the butcher is Satan, and he's driving us because the more busy we get, the less that we'll experience God's goodness as our shepherd. And God says, just rest, rest in me. I am enough. So I want to invite all of us to listen to the shepherd's voice, not the butcher's voice. We need to rest in him and hear his voice so that when the butcher tells us things, we know that that's not from him, that's from the butcher. Psalm 23, back to Psalm 23, this beautiful psalm. Yea, oh, the Lord is my shepherd even in dark valleys. This is what it says. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. The same God who leads us by the peaceful streams and by the green pastures also leads us through the dark valleys. And these may be valleys of health problems, financial crisis, it may be grief, it could be pain. And these dark valleys are uh, very dark. And in, those, in that darkness, it can be hard to see our shepherd. Sometimes it's hard to see that he is with us. It's hard to see that he is leading us. But God is with us, David says, even in that dark valley. This is called the valley of the shadow of death. And out of all the fears that people have, I think that this is the fear that most of us fear the most, is death. Death of ourselves, of a loved one. Uh, it is really the darkest valley that we could encounter. But he says, in this valley of death, I will not fear. I won't even fear death? What do you mean? I mean, I'm looking at this. Help me understand, how do we not fear? Because if you don't fear death, then you don't fear anything. And he says, because God is with me. And another Gideon story Gideon is just starting to discover what fear is. He's just starting to realize the world is kind of a scary place. And so we'll be at home and when there's a truck that goes by, especially because the garbage truck is kind of a really loud noise, <laughs> or it'll be a motorcycle zooming by. And I mean, we don't live in that busy of a street, but still these things happen. And maybe it's a noisy car, you know, one of those really noisy cars that people should probably fix. Well, I shouldn't say that, but <laughs> I have one of those noisy cars. But, uh, <laughs> but Gideon is there, and he'll hear one of these loud noises. And immediately, immediately he cries out, and he looks. And when he sees me, <laughs> Well, he wants to get up, and he wants me to hold him. He wants to know that everything's okay. But when I hold him, he's okay. He doesn't have a problem. He doesn't have a fear in the world. In the same way, that valley of the shadow of death, or whatever valley that you may experience, seems really, really scary. So scary that we may wonder, okay, God, where are you? I need you to hold me. But with him... With us, we don't have to fear anything. When he's holding us, we can be completely secure in his, in his arms and in his care. The good thing about this valley is that it's something that, it's, a, it's not a place that you stay in, but it's something you go through. The good news of that is that we're not there forever. These periods of life come and go, but in those moments, 
even though it may be hard, it may be hard to know that God is with us and hard to know he has a plan for us, hard to know that he's leading us, that place doesn't last forever because he's going to lead us out. and He's going to lead us to a banquet, it says. He's going to lead us to his goodness and he's going to lead us to beautiful green pastures again. So you can hold on while you walk through those valleys. You can walk through your grief and walk on through your pain because he's got a banquet table prepared for you. Your shepherd is going to heal your wounds. He's going to feed your soul and he's going to lead you to those green pastures. So if you're here today and you're going through a valley, hold on because it's not gonna last forever. And he's going to be with you and comfort you and heal you. He is your shepherd. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. His grace pursues me. Well, those are my words, but it's in there. I'll show you how. He says in verse six, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Even in the valley, God is good. And in the meadow, God is good. His goodness follows us, and his goodness is with us. And I love that verse also in the Psalms, taste and see that the Lord is good. His goodness is there for us to enjoy. Not only goodness in the future of eternity, but goodness now in this life to experience his goodness. And the word for mercy actually is chesed, which is the Hebrew. And that is such a deep and meaningful word. I just had to mention it. Because this word is the foundation, the Old Testament foundation for New Testament grace. It is his loving kindness, translated loving kindness, translated mercy. But it's so much deeper than that. It's how God pursues his people, Israel. It's how he goes out of his way to love them, to lavish his love on them, even when they are not interested in his love. The way that he pursues them with his grace, even when they don't deserve it. And he get, grants them pardon when they don't, they don't deserve it. They're guilty. And so this is what God gives us. And the word there, actually, it means, literally, it means to pursue not just follow, but it pursues us, it chases after us, like it's an army <laughs> chasing after someone. So it's his grace and his goodness pursue us. And I think a lot of us many times feel like we have to run after God, uh, that God is somehow maybe running away from us, and we're running after him, and maybe sometime down the road in life before we die, hopefully we will catch him and convince him that we're worthy of his love. And even if we don't maybe verbally say it or really think of it, clearly that thought and that feeling is there. I know it because my mom's a hospital chaplain and she says the worst people <laughs> When it comes to death and dying, a lot of times people who, who struggle with it the most and struggle with peace the most are people with a Methodist background or Adventist background, which stems from the same kind of roots, because a lot of times we don't really know that God forgives us, that he loves us, that he's with us, that his grace is available to us, because we feel like somehow we have to do something to earn his grace and his love, that we have to convince him, run after him, and convince him that somehow we're good enough, we're pious enough, we're godly enough, we've done the right things in order to accept his grace, in order for him to offer us his grace. But the Bible just offers such a completely different picture. And God's grace pursues us, chases after us. And I love that image of lost sheep, another sheep image in, in scripture, because God is the one who chases after us 
when we're out there, even in the wilderness, when we've wandered away from him, he will go over any mountain, through every, any valley and cross over any stream. He will go anywhere it takes to pursue us with his grace. And when he does find us, then he throws a party, a big, huge celebration, because that's how special you and I are to God. And And this one talks about not only him going after us when we're lost, which I think all of us agree that God goes after us when we're lost, but he, his grace sustains us and keeps us every step of the way. And he still pursues us and pursues us and pursues us, even as we're safe in his fold. And this is what Jesus refers to when he says in Matthew, uh, he says, my sheep, oh no, in John, sorry, John chapter 10, uh, the one that I mentioned before, the John 10 and the Psalm 23 go hand in hand because Jesus was really, uh, he was saying, well, I am the good shepherd, meaning I am, I am God, the same God who sustains Israel as their shepherd. That's who Jesus is. And I think that Jesus was thinking of Psalm 23 when he talked about, in, in John 10, all the things that he shared. So in John 10, verses 27 to 30, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. What Jesus is saying is, we are secure in his care as his sheep. That we don't have to be scared that somehow we're going to fall out of favor with God, or somehow we're going to make a mistake, we're not going to be good enough, or somehow that we're just not going to measure up when it comes down to it. And we're in that hospital bed and, and we're facing that valley of the shadow in, in, in the face that somehow we're not going to be good enough to receive his grace and enter his kingdom. But that's not the God that I know. And that's not what Jesus says here. In fact, he says that he'll do whatever it takes. I mean, the same God who died on the cross for you and for me. He went out of his way to do that. How much more will he go out of his way to pursue us with his love and his grace and his care? He's not just going to drop us when we make a mistake. He loves us and cares for us. And he, his grace pursues us. And David says, it's all the days of my life. Not just in the beginning, not in the middle, or just in the end. It's all the days of my life that he pursues me with his grace. And then he closes saying, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How can we not want to dwell with God forever, be with him forever, every waking moment that we have, because he has lavished so much love and grace on us. He provides for our needs he cares for us and gives us rest. And he watches us, he protects us, he steps in and saves us. And he who gave his life for me, who carries my burdens, who meets all of my needs, who's there in the toughest times, who takes away my fear, who pursues me with his grace, I mean, all that he is and all that he has done makes me want to just worship him and praise him and want to just love him the way that he loves me. I want to spend every waking moment the same way that when you're in a relationship, especially a budding 
romance, you want to spend every waking moment that you possibly can with this person and really get to know them and experience this love, that's what God wants us to experience with him. And this is what David is saying, I want to dwell with him in his house forever, throughout eternity. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is your shepherd. Where are you today in your journey with God, in his shepherding of you as his sheep? Are you worried about buying a house or a car or paying the bills or uh, about the having enough money for the clothes or the food that you need or whatever the needs are, are you worried about him meeting your needs? The Lord is your shepherd. He will meet your needs. Are you so busy that you literally just came in church today and, and it's just amazing that you made it and that you're not at home just completely dropped and, and tired and because it's been such a stressful week? The Lord is your shepherd. He gives you rest. Are you in the dark valley today? Are you going through grief? Are you going through pain? Are you facing an impossible situation? The Lord is your shepherd. He will bring you through, and he is with you. And maybe today you're just trying to chase after him and trying to feel loved and accepted by him, trying to gain his favor. The Lord is your shepherd. His grace pursues you. And no matter where you are in this psalm, this is a psalm like her song talked about, about all those ups and downs of life, about that love that we can have for him because he's had that love for us. And i just like to invite you, if, you, if one of those really touched a chord with you, if you want to come up to the front, and we'll just say a prayer together. Because I do think that a lot of us sometimes struggle along this walk as a sheep. And uh, whether we experience his goodness or we're just struggling with finding his goodness, I just want to invite anyone who has a special, I know we invited you to come earlier and pray about your burdens, but, but this is a testament of faith. This is saying, no matter what this situation is in my life, I believe that you are my shepherd, that you will guide me through it, that you will meet my needs, that you will care for me, that you will give me rest. Whatever it is that you're dealing with, if you just want to come forward and just declare to God and to everyone else, the Lord is my shepherd, and to just make that statement of faith, then please join me up here. We'll just say a prayer together. Amen. His blessedness to us is in spite of the circumstances, what they may seem. And so we're just declaring today that the Lord is my shepherd and he will care for me. He will give me rest. He will walk me through whatever it is that I'm facing right now. Let's pray. Loving God, we come to you, our shepherd, knowing that you meet our needs, knowing that you care for us in every way, knowing that sometimes you have to literally make us lie down and rest, and that you are the one who leads us through even difficult places in our lives, that you pursue us with your love, with your grace. God, there may be those here who are dealing with some serious serious struggles, pain or grief, or worry or stress in their lives. 
whatever it is, God, we give it to you, knowing that you are our shepherd. Let us all declare that now, just knowing the Lord is my shepherd. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.